Hello all. This is the first lecture for this course, E six nine eight M. This is a continuation of uh, the introduction we had online today, and uh, due to unfortunate uh, circumstances, my audio got cut off. So I thought it would be a better idea to host a full video. So uh, I'll start from the beginning. So uh, I would like to motivate this lecture. by giving you a short history of the experiments which were conducted somewhere around 1600s to 1900s and most of the material that we will cover during this course is an attempt to explain all these experiments as we go through these experiments you will see the various ways in which the science or the physics has progressed and it will give us the motivation to see what lies ahead right so let's go ahead so the the story of light so light is something which has been investigated right from uh, 1600s and even before newton had already demonstrated his capabilities by explaining the uh, the motion of particles and then the planetary motion and such and he he promulgated this idea that light contains small particles called corpuscles okay and he was able to prove two important properties of light which was reflection and refraction reflection in the sense that uh, an incident ray gets reflected from a surface at the same angle at which it is incident from the uh, from the normal right and this he kind of explained by saying that if there are particles which are perfectly elastic you can easily see that uh, it gets bounced off an interface and goes back this can be proved by uh, newton's laws by force masses and acceleration and such and if you have a body which is rigid and perfectly elastic it will undergo the same kind of bouncing behavior that a ball will undergo right so the reflection is easy to understand refraction he explained in this particular fashion so you have a corpuscle which is being incident at a material at some particular angle right and it is known that as light progresses from a rarer medium this is a rarer medium air to a denser medium it bends towards the normal how do you explain that so a corpuscle which is incident at an interface between a rarer to a denser medium a denser medium which has more particles gets attracted towards the denser medium right and it is this force of attraction newton said makes the velocity of light in the rarer medium let's say v1 and the velocity of light in the denser medium say v2 so he told i mean he predicted v2 to be greater than v1 that is the velocity of light in a denser medium to be larger than the velocity of light in the rarer medium this is because of attractive forces in the denser medium which makes the velocity in the normal component to be larger than the velocity in the transverse component which will make the light to bend towards the normal right because if you have a larger component here and a smaller component here it will typically bend towards the larger component right so this was the idea which he uh, proposed to explain refraction but of obviously we know there are some issues with this right and after about 200 years there were certain experiments which showed this does not necessarily have to be true and it was particularly done by fresnel who said that if we have an expanding light and we have an obstruction at the center right you should have a shadow as shown here but when this shadow is being imaged you will see this kind of a picture instead of having a dark spot at the center you have a bright spot and then some fringes were observed this was observed by fresnel and you also know this particular experiment which is called the young's double split experiment who also showed that if you have a small obstruction in the path of the light the light has some behavior which is reminiscent of how a wave will behave right and if you put a detector here you will see this constructive and destructive interferences which is typically seen in waves the wave theory was initially proposed by hugen in about 1678 to 1690 which is about the time newton also came up with his corpuscular theory but then newton being already famous because of his uh, uh, planetary motion and the law of action uh, huygens theory was almost uh, not considered in all seriousness 
In 1850, Foucault did this uh, beautiful set of experiments. He determined the speed of light as well as the velocity of light in different medium. The experiment goes like this, which is beautiful and neat. He has a light source, which is incident on a mirror, which is mounted on a motor. In 1850, there was no motor, right? So he used what is called as a steam turbine. So this, so this mirror, so which is in black here, which was let's say at some time t equal to zero, light is incident on this, gets reflected. There is a uh, constant mirror here. He kept it at nine meters. The light gets reflected back from this mirror. By that time, it gets reflected back. The mirror which is placed on a motor would have turned, so it would change from this position to this position here, right? It would have rotated. And this rotation will deflect the light at a different path somewhere here and then you read. Now this theta determines how much time the light took from going from up to down. He put it on a motor which rotates or which rotated at that time at around 800 hertz per second or something like that, rotations per minute or something like that. And if all these things are known, you can determine the speed of light and he determined the speed of light to some accuracy. Well, that is not of primary importance. The most important thing was if he replaced the air here by a water tube, which is a denser medium, he found that the light got deflected at a larger angle than when it was at air. So it obviously meant that this water tube slowed down the light. So it broke the theory of Newton, right? Because Newton said that the velocity of light in a denser medium is higher. But these experiments show that the velocity of light in a denser medium is lower. And this typically, this, this brought into prominence again, Huygens wave theory, right? A wave is something like this. You have, a, you have a point, let's say you have a string and then you keep the, you keep making disturbances in the normal direction. It will have a wave which propagates in this direction, let's say X, right? And the disturbance is normal to this propagation. So this is how the light was imagined. You have a particular wavelength, the distance between two crests and the time it takes to go from a crest to a trough, twice the time is called as a time period t. And you have the normal relations of the wave, which you already know. And if you have a wave which goes from a denser, larger medium to a denser medium, the wavelength has to shrink because the light does not change its frequency, which is known, right? The light frequency is known, which is constant. And because the frequency is constant, the velocity and the uh, uh, the wavelength has to change. So the velocity will drop same as the wavelength. Both of them will drop right? so that you have a constant wave at the interface. For the, in for the wave at the interface to be the same, these two has to reduce, which can typically be seen if you have a light which moves from a rarer medium to a denser medium, which can be seen even if you see two rectangles at the interface. So this was the theory of Huygen, but then for light to be a wave, they assumed that the disturbance have to move in some medium, which they called as ether. Okay, so till some time it was assumed that the light goes through something which is called as ether. Before the in advent of uh, Maxwell, who showed that the relationship between electric fields and magnetic fields electric field charge and something have been studied for some time now he came up with this beautiful set of experiment i mean equations this is not the form in which maxwell wrote the equations you will see this later on that this form was probably written by hertz but uh, it is called as maxwell's equations the solutions to maxwell's equations are waves and it was known that the velocity of such waves because as we saw waves before was close to the speed of light which was found by Foucault. right that was we saw before so it was assumed that the light is an electromagnetic wave with propagating at the velocity of light. Velocity that is known to be the velocity of light, right? So this was the origin of light being an electromagnetic wave because the solution to Maxwell's equation that is an electromagnetic waves had uh, velocities close to that of light, right? So we will stop. I mean, we'll not stop, we'll continue with light later on, but during this time, there were also progress on electric transport measurements. 1700s was the first advent of charge, and then you had Coulomb to tell what is the force between them. 
in 1800s dalton was doing some experiments on chemical reactions and then found that you need to have electrons to have chemical reactions and certain metals have certain number of valence electrons the idea of valence took took place and the idea that you have sub atomic particles atom was initially thought indivisible 1835 he said that there are sub atomic particles and in 1897 thomson made this uh, distinctive experiment where he was able to <coughs> expel electrons from um, from cathode and then he made the electrons move in a particular path and if you apply electric and magnetic fields which are transverse to each other you can deflect the total force on the electron was known as the lorentz force which we know to be of this particular form right and if you play with this electric and magnetic field such that the force on this electron is zero in the sense that it moves in straight line you can clearly see that you know what is the velocity velocity can be obtained from this equation right all others are known and if you turn off the magnetic field then there is only an electric field which will push the electron in some direction normal here right and you can calculate what is the deflection this is y which should be half at square right and a being acceleration and you know what is the force force being e then the acceleration should be e by m right and if you can measure this distance you can actually calculate the ratio e by m and he calculated e by m for the first time so this was the origin of uh, a precise measure of an important property that is the electronic charge and mass of an electron but there were further experiments millikan made this infamous experiments there are a lot of issues with this millikan's experiment you can read in wikipedia about the issues with this but then it is a landmark experiment where he measured the electronic charge in an oil bath so he was able to put oil droplets in this fashion and if you have some droplet which moves in a constant velocity down you know that what are the forces on this particular oil droplet it is the volume density of the oil droplet minus density of the air this is buoyancy and g being the gravity so this is the total gravitational force okay and this force should equal to the viscous force which is 6 pi eta rv right so if this is true then there is no force acting on this so basically the only it will move in a constant velocity once it starts moving down initially it should be at rest and then it starts moving down by acceleration and the viscous force will make it to go to a constant velocity regime if you do this then if if you have a oil drop which goes down in a constant velocity then you can estimate what is the size of this droplet and once it falls between these two plates which is shown here so basically i'm just going to expand this you have two electric plates one electric plate in which oil play oil is dropping and then you apply some electric field across this you have an electric field right and you can suspend the oil droplet if you can suspend the oil droplet then the force acting on this would be e and you are you are arresting this so the total upward force would be, i mean downward force will be 4 by 3 pi r cube rho minus rho r into g right this is the downward force and if you apply an equal upward force from the electric field you know that you can calculate what is the electronic charge so he was able to calculate electronic charge to a very precise value there were questions into it, into which how did he get the exact value and such but let's not get into there so the millikan's experiment was useful to measure the electronic charge rutherford came came again to tell you what sort of an structure the atom will have before rutherford came there was an idea that you have the atom as a plum cake where the charges are distributed but he came to show that if you have a uh, uh, if you have a way in which you are able to shoot um uh, alpha particles and you can see how the alpha particles come through the gold foil he saw that most of the alpha particles passes through and few are reflected back at large angles and he knew that it is not a distributed uh, charge scenario and then you have a lot of void in an atom and you have some places where the electronic charge 
is concentrated so this was the idea of how the atom looks and then there were several experiments of having atomic lines where uh, you take the atoms and then heat it to a particular temperature and you let it then you'll see distinct lines distinct line distinct fluorescence you see that the it emits light not in a continuous fashion but discrete lines like this so whenever you have discrete lines there are a lot of issues associated with this the question is why is not smooth already the classical description is out of the window right whenever you don't have something smooth you have something discrete it tells you that you have energy levels which is not continuous more than that it also excludes includes that there is some sort of a selection rule for an transition between one level to the other now there are a lot of i'm mixing a lot of things here you have to talk about emission you have to talk about atomic levels you have to talk about selection rules you have to talk about scattering matrix and such and we will go into detail as we proceed through this course but then these were experimental observations which were yet to be explained that you take a gas and heat it to a particular temperature and characteristic to a gas your particular light is obtained this is where sodium vapor lamps and all those things come into picture right so this is something which needs to be explained and the basic structure of atom itself the question was why is an atom stable at all so you have nucleus and then you have atoms around i mean electrons surrounding it in some in some fashion right if this is what is assumed to be orbits in which electrons go around nucleus the question is why does it remain stable because an electron which moves around this particular uh, thing is accelerating as it accelerates and decelerates it should emit light as it emits light it should actually drop down in energy and fall to lower energy levels so what stops all the electrons in an atom to occupy one energy level or in one radius right and what makes them stable in this particular structure so you one has to understand the various statistics in which electrons reside and one has to understand that there can be only discrete energy levels right why not why should you have discrete circumferences discrete circles why don't you have a sphere in which an electron can occupy all sorts of states right there are so many questions about the structure of the atom which was yet to be explained we will see this when we see the structure of an hydrogen atom in quantum mechanics let's i hope that we'll have time to address that right so while well, all these questions we are still let's get back to light so in 1899 there was this experiment by lenard who did this on um, the experiment on photoelectric effects so he showed that if i have an electric plate separated by a distance we remember we talked about thomson's experiment right so the, there were developments in vacuum tubes and uh, rectifiers and such we did not go into details somewhere around 1880s to 1900s people determined i mean i uh, discovered invented vacuum tubes where they were able to show rectifying behavior and there was also of electron transport measurements and all those things we kind of glossed through all these uh, discover inventions but when we talk about uh, this vacuum tubes you have an cathode and an anode and then you apply electric field and then you have electrons moving from one plate to the other it was shown that if we shine light then the potential that is required to start electron emission from one plate changes so this v not is called the threshold voltage and we lenard showed that the threshold voltage v when the light is uh, incident on this plate do not depend upon the intensity of the light rather it depends upon the wavelength of the light once it starts the current depends upon the intensity right so once you let us say that i put some light and i am applying some potential let's say v not plus del v right you start getting some current through this the intensity plays a role whether it is this current or it is this current or something of that sort but the starting point of emission determines is determined not by the intensity of the light but by the wavelength so to understand this the wave picture was soon uh, insufficient right because for a wave the energy is just a square of the amplitude so if you want if this is the wave if you want a high energy wave you just increase the amplitude right so higher the amplitude higher the intensity and hence this energy of the wave 
changing by just the energy of the wave i mean just the intensity not being sufficient to give sufficient energy for the electron to be injected cannot be fully appreciated if you still have the wave picture of light and it is in 1905 that the einstein came about and then said that you cannot treat light purely as a wave but you should think of light as corpuscles again having different energies depending upon the color of the light right he said the blue light will have higher energy and the red having lower energy right so he came up with this idea once again so we have come back in a circle going back to newton's idea that light cannot be fully described as a wave but then you need to understand light as corpuscles right so that now you can see that if you have corpuscles you have corpuscles incidenting on a plate it is going to transfer energy to an electron to be ejected and if you it does not matter right if you have uh, hundreds of uh, corpuscles with low energy each one of them cannot give enough energy for an electron to be ejected out right like a billiard ball so you need an an um, a particle which is incident at a which has a larger energy to give an electron enough energy enough incentive to exit from a cathode and go back to the anode right so that is the that is the idea of einstein photoelectric effect but then this idea stemmed not from einstein but then it was first described by planck in his black body radiation problem the idea was if i take any substance it is always in thermodynamic equilibrium with an electromagnetic wave so that is the idea so as you increase the temperature the equilibrium distribution of electromagnetic waves that is across this wavelength changes and as you increase the temperature you can see that the peak intensity of the wavelength i mean the peak intensity wavelength blue shifts it goes to higher and higher energies and lower and lower wavelengths but it also drops at very high wavelengths right so this is called ultraviolet catastrophe this was what was really upsetting planck right the classical theory if you use equipartition theorem predicts that the uh, the distribution of photons which is in equilibrium with a body should have its intensity uh, exploding as the wavelength drops so you should have this sort of a behavior if you use corpus i mean uh, classical equipartition theorem but planck showed that this cannot be true because experiments showed that you the uh, a heated body emits wavelength such that the ultraviolet intensity drops we will not go into the derivation of planck's black body radiation but then it will stem from the static stat mechanics that we will deal later on to show that how electrons and photons have their uh, distribution in an equilibrium state okay before we end this session let us uh, consider two important um, examples with light which show that the classical physics is not uh, complete right the first one is regarding polarization let's assume that a light is propagating along the the z axis and of course the electric field can now be polarized along either the uh, the x or the y right and if the uh, electric field is polarized along the x you call it x polarized light and if it is polarized along uh, y you call it the y polarized light right and you also know that there exists two kind of uh, there exists what is called as a polarizer which allows light of only one particular kind so if i have a light beam going like this incidenting on a polarizer right and let's assume that you have only the something like this right it will allow light which has this x polarization right so it will only allow the x polarized light i'm going to write the x polarized light to be something like this this is an x polarizer right and if an y polarized light is incident on this something of this particular sort nothing will come out right so let me let me clarify this in this particular fashion 
so i have a x polarizer and i have a light which is x polarized it comes out x polarized and if i have a light which is y polarized nothing comes out right this is an x polarizer the same thing can be drawn for a y polarizer written as py right and if i have a y polarized light incident on this it goes out y polarized without getting any effect and if i have an x polarized into this it sends out an x sorry nothing comes out right it gives a null value now the question is what happens if i start stacking one and the other right so i have an x polarized light incidenting on an x polarizer i get out an x polarized light and i put it through a y polarizer obviously nothing comes out right now always understand that each of these line each of this photon or light laser if we might call it has millions of uh, corpuscles or photons each of the photon has particular polarization right so basically each this line has a large collection of independent balls each of them having some polarization in the first case all of them had polarization along x second case all of them had polarization along y there can also be a case where you have an random light right which has both x polarization and y polarization what happens obviously only the x comes out sorry but now it's only half the intensity right because half of them are y similarly if you have the other light into an y only the y half will come out now the same is true if i if i replace if i have y first x next right and then send into this i get nothing out this is a null this is null so what i mean to say here is if i had px and py as an operator right acting on some state some photonic state right x it always gives me zero the same thing if i have py polarization px polarization acting on some polarized light right always gives zero right that is what we see because this one will give me zero if i have this this will go through right but again it will give out and the combination will always give out and now let us look at something something very interesting you can also have what is called as a 45 degree one something like this right so what it does is if i send in a purely x polarized light right it sends out half the intensity if i send out send in a purely y polarized light it sends out half it's easily understandable right something which is 45 normal half of them passes through because you can always uh, divide this particular uh, thing into into two components right so it sends out half the component along the transverse half the component along the normal right but what happens if you send in this guy will it send out full or half all of them are half the answer surprisingly is that it sent out only half right the reason behind this is each one of this photon is either x polarized or y polarized and not both right if it is either x or y 
each of the time it passes through it only passes through only half of them right so this is this is something that has to be uh, understood right now let's look at an interesting situation if i have an x polarizer and a y polarizer This is x and we know that anything which comes out nothing will anything which will come in nothing will come out right one of them will block okay we know that much now what happens if i have an x through this and put in something put in our multicolored guy in between So we know that the x will go through this right but when it is like this only half of the x came in but this is not null similarly if i have this guy here and this guy here right and then you put an a uh, red line through this you will again get not null which should have been null in the first place so what it goes to show is let's say this is px this is pxy and this is py this these are three operators right so px acting on some some state let's say z state is not the same as px py pxy right acting on the same z state why px and py will anyway give you a zero always and that acting on pxy will again give you a zero but whereas this is a non zero value so it says that three observations now you can have observations which are not commutable you cannot move one by the other in typical classical mechanics you measure velocity you measure position and then you can again measure velocity nothing will change but then in quantum mechanics if you measure if you measure things in a different order you can expect different results right it basically comes from the fact that what you do here or you do here in any one of these case right when you define the polarization of a light very precisely right it automatically changes its polarization in the other direction you increase the uncertainty in the y direction to such an extent that it will confuse the next measurement so every measurement inevitably modulates or changes the state of the system such that the other measurement does not see the same uh particle which was incident to the first guy right so so this this experiment is something which is very interesting and one has to clearly understand what these measurements are and what are commutable measurements and what are uh, non commuting measurements and such right so this is the first one the second one is the is a modification of the young's double slit experiment uh, i don't know if you have seen feynman's lectures he had explained this beautifully i will try to just very briefly explain what he says but i highly recommend you to go and look at what feynman has to say on this let's say i have a source of electron photon whatever be it right it is going through some slot here so you have some stream of electrons or photons so whatever some some non classical particle right something not a tennis ball that's what i mean by non classical particle and uh, i was wrong in drawing something in this particular fashion i have something which goes like this right and now i have the second slit like this and i have a detector right let's assume that this guy is does not have a hole initially okay something like this and when we have something like this whatever is incident right you expect the, them 
whatever whatever particle which is going through we expect it to form this sort of a distribution on the detector right you will have maximum detection here through the hole very minimum here in all other places you expect a gaussian here and if you have a second hole here such that you do not have uh, a hole here right what you expect to see is something like this right? maximum here assume this is a gaussian right okay so because some of the light will go from here to here so maximum light will come here right so what do we expect when both of them to be on so I'm going to change this when I have something like this. Classically, we will expect a superposition of both of them and then you will have something like this. The probability of a detector will see something like this. Let's say I have a constant stream of photons. You will you expect to see something like this. But in contrary, what you see is this. this is what light sees the detector at this particular point sees so what it means is classically where there has to be a minimum you get a maximum and this can once again be seen only if you have this guy not being as particles but being as a wave right this is typically an uh, interference pattern that you will see once again as seen by young's double slit experiment so you will see this only if you have wave so once again there's a question of whether you have a, whether you have as a particle or you have as a wave but what is so quantum about this is if you put a light source here right and let's say you are you are injecting electron particles and then you have a strong light source and then you see each time a particle goes through whether does it goes through this hole or does it go through this hole right if you have if you try to measure the path of the electron then you don't see this interference pattern but you see rather this so basically this is without measurement and this is with measurement so if you measure or if you observe the path of the particle you will get something like this if you do not observe the path of the particle you get something like this you get an interference pattern so what it typically means is that the particle which goes through this or which is being emitted by this source has two alternate paths and it has it is superposed in this path in the sense that it can move in any of these paths but when you do a measurement to see where the particle goes then you collapse this particle to go through only one path so it goes either through this hole or through this hole so it does not give you this interference but does this particular uh, classical picture and this is the quantum picture so let's hope that by the end of this course we understand the nature of these particles and then we see that you cannot really know however good your measurement is you really cannot know which way it goes without affecting the particle right so with this particular uh, very brief discussion i stop here next time we meet let's talk about some classical introduction and then we will uh, we'll jump into quantum mechanics from the uh, from the second lecture from here thank you